Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending JIRP webinar today. I'm Won Jung Che, and I'm postdoc researcher in Professor Sam's group at Colorado School of Mines. I hope all of you are doing well and staying safe. And today, I'm going to be chair of the JIRP, JIRP P webinar. The presentation will be last 40 minutes, then we're going to have 20 minutes of Q&A session. At the time, please feel free to ask any questions. And today we will listen to the lecture of Professor Alabi. I'm glad to introduce him in this seminar. Currently, Professor Alabi is an uh, adjunct professor at the Department of Chemistry and Biomolecular Science in University of Ottawa at Canada. He got his doctoral degree from the University of British Columbia at 1999. So, uh, today's topic is hydrogen bonding class rate hydrate gas hydrate, hydrate promoters or inhibitors. Professor Alabi, thanks for having accepted your valuable seminar to us. And please share your screen and start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. I'll uh, share the screen now. Okay. Um, so is the screen uh, is the screen there now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to present this talk. In particular, I'd like to thank Dr. Choi and uh, Professor Sum for for the invitation. Um, in this work, I'll uh, in this talk, I'll describe some of our work uh, in the recent years regarding um, hydrogen bonding in um, yes yes host hydrogen bonding in clathrate hydrates. And some of the uh, ramifications this may have uh, on modeling of the clathrate hydrates, and also uh, maybe some new twists to the roles of some clathrate hydrate inhibitors, in particular ammonia and methanol. Let's see if I can get this to change. Yeah. So. Uh, the short outline uh, before I start, it's uh, first I'll describe the uh, structure of clathrate hydrates and very quick description of the molecular dynamics technique that we use. Uh, I'll describe some uh, hydrogen bonding guests and how we characterize hydrogen bonding uh, among the, the guests with the hydrate uh, cage. I'll talk in particular uh, a little bit more about methanol and ammonia as uh, clathrate hydrate guests, their inhibitor effects and somehow their rate enhancing effects under some conditions. I'll mention um, some new work that uh, our experimentalist colleagues are doing, uh, in particular, Professor Kyocho Shin in, in uh, South Korea, and also how that uh, sort of enhances some hydrogen bonding um, uh, modes in, in the clathrate hydrates among guests. I'll, I'll finish with some conclusion and potential outlook. And before I start, I'd like to give acknowledgement to some of my coworkers, uh, in particular to Dr. John Ripmeister, who I've now been working with over, over 15 years. Um, Dr. Robin Susilo, uh, Dr. Konstantin Udachin, uh, Professor Rio Mura, and Professor Kyosho Shin are, are all, uh, and their groups have contributions um, to some of these projects, which I'd like to acknowledge here right, right at the beginning. So um, first of all, uh, before I go, let me just uh, review uh, the ways that we can actually form clathrate hydrates. These are, of course, uh, well known to everyone here, um, but they, they do become relevant in some of the effects that we do, we see. So a common way with uh, gas phase uh, materials that are not very polar, of course, we uh, cool the water, uh, as, as shown here in the schematic um, uh, figure of a reaction cell. We cool water and expose it to high pressures of a gas such as methane, and if the temperature pressure combination is uh, within a certain range, we see that the, the solid ice-like phase uh, forms at the interface, which uh, upon analysis become, is found to be the clathrate hydrate. So this is one common method for, for gas species uh, of, of forming hydrates. And of course, there's variations where you can spray the, the, um, the water in the high pressure gas uh, reactor, et cetera. Another way, of course, uh, uh, for uh, liquid uh, guests, that which are larger, is just, and if, if they're miscible with water, is to just uh, form the solutions, such as THF with water, and just cool it. And we'll see that uh, uh, above the temperature, uh, freezing temperature of, of, of the water, uh, a solid hydrate, uh, clathrate hydrate formed with, for example, THF. 
For some, uh, for some uh, other guests, uh, in addition to cooling uh, the water phase, we may need to actually subject the solution to a pressure of a secondary gas for them to, to form. So this is another way of forming uh, hydrates with some guests. Uh, in some cases, we can have a uh, uh, water organic two-phase system and we can cool it. And at the interphase, um, we do see uh, clathrate hydrates forming and that's uh, for the case of cyclopentane. Um, there's also uh, other methods where we can get powdered ice samples. So we get an ice sample, we powder it and then subject it uh, to high pressure gas. That's another way of forming a hydrate or we can uh, co-deposit uh, gases, uh, amorphous, co-deposit amorphous ice and a solute. In our case, we do that with ammonium methanol, powder the solid phase and then subject it to high pressures of a secondary gas. And, and under those conditions, um, a hydrate can actually form from, from the solid amorphous ice um, phase. So it doesn't have to be a liquid in order to get a hydrate. It's a little bit slower with the powdered uh, ice samples, but nonetheless, um, the ice does transform to a clathrate hydrate. So, so these are a, a sort of a summary of ways where um, we can synthesize clathrate hydrate phases. In terms of the structures, a quick review may be uh, helpful. So in um, clathrate hydrates, um, depending on the size of the guest, uh, we uh, have water cages that form to encapsulate the guest species. And uh, there's a variety of uh, shapes for these uh, yeah, uh, cages um, and uh, which particular cage forms depends on primarily on the size of the guest, maybe a little bit on the chemical nature of the guest as, as well. Um, the smallest cages that form are dodecahedral cages and we have two forms that form in what, what are called the canonical hydrate, uh, class rate hydrate phases. There's a 14-sided uh, cage, uh, a 16-sided cage, and a 20-sided cage also. And you can see as the number of sides increases, uh, the, the size of the cage sides increases, the size of the cage also um, becomes larger and they can uh, in, encompass uh, larger yes sizes. The cages that are formed here and they're shown schematic, in each of the uh, corners, uh, there's a water molecule and the sides of these cages are formed by hydrogen bonds. Um, the hydrogen bond in the, in the clathrate hydrate uh, phases obey the ice rules. And um, in other words, each of the waters has two protein donating and two prote proton accepting hydrogen bonds, etc. cetera. Um, um, in the hydrate phase as a whole, the uh, hydrogen orientations for the waters are disordered. So all the water hydrogens are not pointing in a certain direction. Among the sample, these are disordered. And we can see because uh, uh, one type of yes, one type of cage does not fill space. We have a variety of cages in any particular hydrate cage. And the angles of the hydrogen bonding that we have in a particular hydrate cage is there may be around 108 degrees if we have pentagonal faces, but we may also see hydrogen bonds which are forced to accommodate 120 degrees in the hexagonal faces of the cages, or even 90 degrees in some of the square faces of, of this particular, of the particular cage. So uh, some of the hydrogen bonds in the clathrate hydrate phases may be under some strain and maybe weaker than the more ideal 108 degrees for the hydrogen bonds that we see in pentagonal phases in these cages. In terms of the structures, the way the, um, as I mentioned, one particular type of cage does not fill space. So in order to fill space uh, and form these clathrate hydrate cages, we need at least two types of cages. And uh, by packing um, the 14-sided cage with the 12-sided cage, um, we can get the uh, canonical cubic structure one. Um, by packing the 16-sided and the 12-sided uh, cages, we can get the cubic structure two. And by packing the 20-sided and two of the types of the 12-sided cages, we can get the hexagonal uh, structure three phases. Um, and here is some, uh, just to summarize, the, the nature of the cages that make a unit cell and also the relative, relative size of the unit cell. So these pictures are somewhat to scale in terms of the size of the unit cell uh, in each of these uh, canonical clathrate hydrate uh, phase structures. So these three form what we call the canonical uh, clathrate hydrate phases. Um, so in addition to experimental uh, 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 measurements that my colleagues make on, on these structures, I used uh, molecular dynamic simulations of the hydrate phases to detect the um, potential hydrogen bonding. Um, and so uh, a very, very brief summary, just because maybe I'll use it uh, in some of the uh, uh, discussions later. 
In the classical molecular dynamics, what we do is we first assign uh, positions to all the atoms uh, in, in the uh, simulation, uh, which in our case would be a clathrate hydrate phase. And uh, we determine the motion of the every single atom in, in this uh, setup uh, according to Newton's uh, equations of motion, where the dynamics is depending on the force that each atom uh, feels. Um, and this force uh, that any particular atom feels may be from other atoms in the same molecule, which are called intramolecular forces, or from atoms in other molecules in the simulation, which are the intermolecular um, uh, forces. So once we know what the nature of the forces are um, between the different atoms and we know where they are, we can use Newton's equations of motion uh, to find uh, how these atoms will move over time. Uh, of course, there's a number of constraints that we apply to Newton's equations uh, in such a way that uh, the pressure and temperature uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are imposed externally on the system remain constant during the simulation, and the result of the simulation is consistent with uh, thermodynamics. But uh, other than that, uh, we, we basically have a numerical recipe where we can sort of see how the uh, system would behave over time. And if we've modeled the structures and forces correctly, we can get the behavior of all the uh, atoms um, in terms of their position and velocities at all time in the future. And then from them, we can, uh, from these, we can determine the experiment, the microscopic details of the behavior of the atoms and molecules. And also we can extract the um, bulk properties uh, of them that are good for thermodynamic analysis. Um, uh, because they're somewhat important, I'll just uh, uh, give the forms of the intermolecular uh, potentials uh, that we use in the classical molecular dynamics. So for example, if we have a guest inside a water cage, where here we have a methane inside a small uh, D, the decahedral cage. Here we have a CO2 inside a large um, tetrachide decahedral or 14-sided cage. Uh, every single atom of the guest is assumed to interact with every single atom of the waters in the cages. And these interactions may have an electrostatic component and a van der Waals component. The electrostatic component is modeled mostly with, uh, as point charges. So we assume that each of the atoms on the guest has a point charge and they interact with the point charges on the waters. And also there's van der Waals interactions um, between each atom of the guest and each atom of, of the cage. And it's, these, uh, it's the sum of these two that sort of determine how the guest interacts um, with, the, with the cage. So within this picture, um, what, what sort of microscopic uh, idea do we have of the guests uh, uh, moving in the clathrate hydrate cages? Well, here's a molecular dynamic simulation from carbon dioxide in a, a clathrate hydrate phase at 100 Kelvin. Here we have, uh, it's, uh, it's a three by three by three simulation and we're just showing one cross section. Basically, um, I hope you see the simulation, but uh, what we see in the simulation at uh, around 100 degrees, we're, we're showing the CO2 molecules explicitly inside the middle of the cages and the waters are shown by the red lines which indicate the hydrogen bonding in the water. So basically the molecules move a little bit, the, the CO2 molecules move a little bit and for the water molecules in the cages, there's some vibrational motion as well. Basically, we could say maybe nothing much interesting happens in, in the case of uh, a certain class of molecule like CO2. They move in the middle of the cage. Um, they, they may have a limited range of motion, but depending on the temperature and the vibrational motions of the cage and the gas, there, there's some um, limited um, motion of limited interest, so to speak, inside, inside the cage. Oops. And if we zoom in a little bit to a particular cage, so this is one cage that's been extracted from the molecular dynamics simulation. This is large cage in the structure one hydrate, and this is for 275. So if we zoom in a little bit uh, here, we can see that the cage is actually a little bit flexible. So these are the vibrational motions of the water cage. Um, we don't show the waters explicitly, it's just basically the hydrogen bonds. And we have the CO2 in the middle. So we can see the gas, <coughs> moves under the influence of the potential field of the cage. The range of the motion is somewhat limited, but there is like a rotational motion and uh, the guest moves are uh, basically center in the middle of, of, the, uh, of the cage. The interactions that determine how close the uh, guest sort of moves within the cage are the um, Van der Waals and electrostatic interactions 
um, of, of the guests in the cage. And in general, the, the guest prefers to spend most of the time in the low energy positions in the, um, in, in the cage. So this is basically the picture we have for simple guests that are non-interacting, um, that, don't, that don't form hydrogen bonds. Um, the model that, that's very successful for um, um, predicting the phase diagram of uh, types of guests like CO2 or, or methane is the van der Waals plateau uh, theory. And this theory um, basically starts with the assumption, the starting point is the thermodynamic equality of the chemical potentials of the hydrate phase and the aqueous phase and methane gas that, that form it at equilibrium. So starting with this thermodynamic relation, <laughs> the van der Waals plateau theory makes a number of assumptions and the ones that are relevant to the hydrate phase are that the guest molecules in the cage do not distort the host lattice and the volume of the lattice doesn't change upon encapsulation of the guest. And we saw that for CO2 in the picture we had, maybe that's not a bad assumption. The CO2 maybe distorts the cage, but not, not to a large extent. And also the second assumption that the Van der Waals plateau makes, theory makes is that the uh, guest molecules interact only with the cage they're in, and there's not much interaction between guests and adjacent cage waters and also adjacent cage uh, guests. And so each cage and guest uh, is, is independent of, of the others. So based on making these two, two assumptions and the Van der Waals plateau theory um, uh, expressions for the um, chemical potential of the guests inside the hydrate phase are, are made and uh, we can go and actually make an expression, get, get an explicit uh, expression for the chemical potential of the hydrate phase. For the aqueous phase, there's well-known um, statistical mechanical uh, forms for the chemical potential as well. In implementing the Van der Waals potential, uh, uh, Van der Waals uh, plateau theory, um, we come up to a uh, sort of an integral, uh, which gives us what's called the Langmuir constant, which determines the occupancy of the small and large cages. And this uh, Langmuir constant is an integral of the net interaction of the guests inside the cage. And it's a different integral for the guests inside the small or large cage. And what we're doing is we're inter basically we're integrating over the uh, total interaction potential of the guests in the cage for all positions of the guests in the cage and all angles that the guests may have in the cage. And so the, the integral over V here is over the volume of the cage and omega is all rotational angles that the guest may have. Usually uh, simplifying assumptions are made uh, and, that's, uh, and that sort of uh, converts the general integral to the simplified integral where the assumption is made that the uh, potential of the guest inside the cage is spherical. We saw the guest shapes are not, the, the guest shapes are not spherical. The cages themselves are not spherical, but the assumption is made that we can sort of represent this interaction by a, an average spherical uh, uh, W function. Um, which is given here, the angular dependence goes out. And so what we're doing here is now just angling over, averaging over a spherical um, average cage radius. And what usually is used uh, to, to, to take this integral further and actually evaluate is, is we assume that there's a Kihara potential between individual water guest interactions. And if we sum over all of these Kihara potentials for the guest host, we get uh, the W, which is the total interaction of the guest inside the cage. Um, which is given here. There's the Z, which is the total number of waters in the cage. And there's the R, which is the average effective cage radius. So this is usually what we use to model the phased uh, equilibrium uh, of uh, guests like methane or CO2. Um, however, we, we know that, um, so, so there's some assumptions made. And uh, so the first of course, is we know that all guests and cages are not spherically symmetric. So there are some assumptions made uh, in getting this to this final point. And also, of course, what we've done here is we've washed away all the complexity of any specific guest cage interactions there may be. So if there's any specific uh, electrostatic or hydrogen bonding interactions, those are all washed out and we just express it as a, as a general um, van der Waals type interaction. However, um, experimentally it's known that uh, in addition to these more sort of maybe uh, neutral or non-polar guests, many um, uh, guests form clathrate hydrates uh, and these guest molecules may actually be totally miscible in water and they form strong hydrogen bonds in water. 
So for example, in, uh, for the structure one, structure two, and structure eight hydrates, here's a list of some of the uh, hydrate phases that have been formed. So for example, ethanol, which is totally miscible in water, can form a structure one hydrate when it's compressed with CO2 gas. Or tetrahydrofuran, THF, we know is totally miscible in water. It very easily forms a hydrate cage, even though it forms strong hydrogen bonds with, with water. And like other alcohols, like 1-propanol, 2-propanol, tetrahydropyrane, uh, some amines like tertiary butylamine, and even some structure H forming um, large molecules, which may not be miscible in water, are still hydrogen bonding. And, and so in these cases, um, maybe the assumption that the, that the guest is sort of inert and is just lingering in the middle of the cage may not apply. So there are some experimental um, studies done on these and molecular dynamics, which shows that indeed some of these guests do form hydrogen bonds. And the um, experimental evidence is, is, uh, is through numerical techniques, uh, single crystal X-ray diffraction, uh, NMR relaxation times, dielectric relaxation, some uh, Raman measurements, and finally uh, molecular dynamic simulations all show evidence that some of the guests that I mentioned do form strong hydrogen bonds. And, and so, uh, and what I'm going to show is some of these uh, some of these results, but mostly the MD results. For the MD results, uh, the hydrogen bond, we basically uh, define whether um, the guests and hosts are hydrogen bond. It's visually quite, quite, um, uh, it's visually quite clear, but if we're using a mathematical criteria for some of the calculations, it's that the, uh, that the HO uh, hydrogen bond distance is between 1.44 and 2.10, that's typical. And the angle here is uh, 100, it usually should be 180 degrees for ideal hydrogen bonds. But um, if it's larger than 110 and it meets the distance criteria, we say there's a hydrogen bond. And similar for amines, uh, which we have a few, um, there's criteria, also a geometric criteria for hydrogen bond formation. So let's see the type of hydrogen bonds that are uh, observed through the simulation with, uh, with some of the uh, guests. So here, um, I'll, I'll show three samples. So here we have one type of hydrogen bond between an ethanol guest and the cage that it's encapsulated. And if you can see here, um, ethanol here is um, donating a proton to one of the waters in the cage. So we have uh, the guest making one hydrogen bond with a cage water, and it's a proton donating hydrogen bond. Another, another more interesting example of hydrogen bonds that is observed through the MD simulation is with one protonol in the structure two hydrate with the small cage guest methane. And here actually we can see that the one propanol has two hydrogen bonds with the water in the cage. One where it donates, it's a protein donating, proton donating um, hydrogen bond, and the other is a protein, proton accepting hydrogen bond where the water actually donates the proton. The interesting thing is we can see that this propanol guest has sort of broken the hydrogen bond between two water molecules and inserted itself um, within, within that, that particular hydrogen bond. And so you can see the integrity of the cage is sort of somewhat, uh, somewhat affected by this propanol inserting itself within, um, with, within the two hydrogen bonds. The other uh, point we can see is that propanol is now very close to the hydrate cage wall. So um, it's, it's, no, it's within the Van der Waals radius of some of the water molecules of the wall. And so it's no longer lingering in the center of the cage, but rather it, uh, because, of these, um, because of these hydrogen bonding interactions, it's more interacting with the cage, cage wall. Another interesting case of hydrogen bonding observed in MD simulations is in 2-propanol. Um, and this is where, again, the 2-propanol is involved in two hydrogen bonds, one where it's proton donating, the other is proton accepting. But in this case, the two waters involved in the uh, hydrogen bond with 2-propanol are not adjacent waters from the cage, but they're actually um, separate. The two waters that are forming the hydrogen bond with 2-propanol are, are separated by one water in between them. So that's another interesting uh, pattern of hydrogen bonding that, that, can, um, that can occur in, in some of these guests. So there's not only one type of hydrogen bonding, there's hydrogen bonding where the guest, where the cage sort of remains intact, but there's hydrogen bonding where the guest can actually insert itself um, between, between the water molecules. Um, for THF, which is a very well-known uh, hydrate, um, we also see uh, a simple hydrogen bonding where uh, here are two configurations without hydrogen bonding. One of the water molecules uh, breaks its hydrogen bond with another water molecule. 
it rotates down and sort of forms a hydrogen bond uh, with the THF as, as we see here. And so the THF again gets attracted to the cage wall. It doesn't stay in the center anymore. Um, and for at least a limited time can form a hydrogen bond. It sort of has a leash to it and it forms a hydrogen bond to the, um, to the cage. <clears throat> now, the, the effect of the hydrogen bonds that the guests form with the water is that uh, Bayram defects form in the hydrate lattice. So what Bayram defects are, any ice phase uh, has some defects and uh, one of the types of defects is called the Bayram defect. And the Bayram defect is, is related to the water adjacent water molecules not obeying the ice rules. In other words, there, there can be either two hydrogens pointing between uh, the oxygen centers of two waters, which is one type of defect, which is called the Bayram D defect. And the other case may be a Bayram L defect where there's no hydrogens, there's no protons between two adjacent waters in the ice network. And this is called the Bayram L defect. So both of these are defects in any type of ice lattice and they affect the dielectric relaxation and other properties um, that the ice lattice may have. And we can see that um, uh, as a result of the hydrogen bonding of one of the water molecules, if it, protein, if it donates a proton to a guest species, what happens is a Bayram L defect gets inserted within the, um, within the cage. So two of the water molecules in the cage now have a Bayram L defect as a result of the hydrogen bonding of one of the waters um, with, the, uh, with the guest molecule. Um, so how can we characterize these hydrogen bonds? Are they, once a hydrogen bond forms, is it stable or, or does the water break the hydrogen bond and flip back into the network? Well, in the case of THF, for example, what we have here is over roughly, um, uh, this is 400 picoseconds, we've taken one particular cage and any time that the THF met the criteria of hydrogen bonding with the water molecule in the cage, we've assigned a, a, a defect. We've assigned the cage to have a defect. And whenever the geometric criteria was not met, there's no defect. So at 200 Kelvin over 400 picoseconds, we can see that the uh, THF um, does form defects, but all these defects are relatively short lived. The THF is hydrogen bonded, but very soon because of lattice vibrations, the water flips back and the hydrogen bond is broken. If the temperature increases, if the temperature of the clathrate hydrate phase increases, we see that the lifetime of the hydrogen bonds is still short, but there's more probability of hydrogen bonding. So the THF forms more hydrogen bonds with the waters and the lattice. And we can understand that based on the fact that as temperature increases, the lattice vibrations increase, the water-water hydrogen bonds become weaker, and so that, op that provides an opening for THF to form hydrogen bonds. Now, if we take the probability of hydrogen bonding, not only with one cage, but over all cages within the hydrate, we basically can have an equilibrium constant between hydrogen bonded configurations and non-hydrogen bonded configurations of the THF. And if we plot this equilibrium constant in the form of a Van't Hoff plot, we see that we get a fairly straight line. And so from this Van't Hoff plot, um, if we plot the probability, the log of the probability against the inverse of the temperature, we get a straight line from which we can um, uh, find an enthalpy for this hydrogen bond uh, formation process. So what's the enthalpy for the breaking of the water-water hydrogen bonds and the formation of a THF water hydrogen bond instead? And so that's sort of an, an interesting piece of information that we can extract from the MD simulations. And then, and in, okay, so that's for THF, maybe in an isolated THF hydrate. The second set of simulations we did, which was sort of isolate, interesting, we, rather than just having a THF in structure two, we put different um, guests, we formed different binary structure two THF hydrates, and we put either different chemical guests inside the small cages, or in the case of CO2, if we put them in the small cages, we put different concentrations. And we did the same type of calculation to see whether as a result of putting small cages, small guests in the, in the small cages, are the hydrogen bonds of the THF affected or not? And if we do the same type of calculations, we see that indeed the uh, hydrogen bonding probability of THF is affected by both the nature of the guests in the small cages and also the concentration of the guests in the small cages. So these are the Van't Hoff plots for THF hydrogen bonding with in different uh, binary or, or in this one case, the middle case in case of the pure um, uh, 
THF hydrate. So we see in some cases, um, there's more hydrogen bonds formed between THF and the water cages for some small guests. And for other small guests, it seems maybe the water lattice is more stable and there's less THF water hydrogen bonding. So in some sense, we see there's some interaction actually between the nature of what's in the small cages and the hydrogen bonding of THF in the large cages. So that uh, was, was an interesting um, experiment, which is sort of against the assumptions of the van der Waals plateau theory. Another interesting phenomena that can happen when the cage uh, waters in, uh, hydrogen bond with the guests is so shown schematically here. So here, the first in the first figure, um, we have a guest in not hydrogen bonding with the uh, cage. Here in the second uh, panel, we see that one of the cage guests, uh, one of the waters in the cage has rotated to hydrogen bond with the guest. And as a result, what forms here is a Bayram L defect between two waters uh, of, of the cage, which are shown schematically here. Now, what can happen, of course, is this water does hydrogen bonding to the guests, can break the hydrogen bond and flip back into the, uh, into the cage uh, framework. But another uh, uh, thing that can happen, and we observe it, we observed in the MD, is that a neighboring water can actually rotate to uh, fill this Bayram L defect. And what happens in that case is the Bayram L defect migrates um, to uh, two other waters within the lattice framework. And, and so you can see, we can see the migration of the Bayram L defects. Now, what this does basically, it sort of freezes in the water guest hydrogen bond because. Now, in order for the water gas hydrogen bond to break, we need two waters to rotate back to their initial positions. And so as a result of the, of the migration of the Bayram L defect, um, the water gas hydrogen bonds become more, more stable. And that's something that we, we've seen. And so then the mobility of the guests inside the cage may be, may be uh, decreased as a result of this particular process. Now, if we look at some experimental measurements on the gas reorientation, from both dialectic dipole reorientation studies and also NMR relaxation times, we see, for example, cyclopentane um, has a, smallest, a smaller guest reorientation activation energy compared to THF hydrate in the structure two phase. And, and uh, uh, of course, that, that's likely related to the hydrogen bonding of THF with water. And the simulations show that explicitly. Because the THF forms hydrogen bonds with cages, it may be less mobile. And so to rotate the THF molecule inside the cage, we need a larger activation energy related to partially breaking these hydrogen bonds of THF with the cage, whereas the cyclopentane doesn't form them. Another interesting measurement that's done experimentally is what are the activation energies for water reorientation in the cage? And these can be measured by dielectric measurements. And if we compare the THF hydrate with uh, hexagonal ice, we see that the water rotations are also require much less energy in the clathrate hydrate than they do in ice. And that's because in the THF clathrate hydrate, some of the THF water um, hydrogen bonds al uh, allow the Bayram defects to, to, um, um, to migrate much more easily than they would in an ice phase. And so we can see that the energy for reorientation of water molecules in the THF hydrate is much less than it would be in an ice phase where um, you don't see a lone Bayram defect be, be able to, to, um, um, to migrate. In, in a pure water phase, you'd have two Bayram defects forming at the same time. You would not just get one forming uh, with, uh, with the migration. So that's another interesting observation that, that, that an explanation for some experimental observations we have. Another interesting observation that can be made from uh, the hydrogen bond formation that we mentioned briefly is of course that the hydrogen bond formation sort of affects the integrity of the cages. And so we expect the cages to be less robust compared to um, compressibility to external pressure. And, and here there's a table, uh, this is experimental, of the uh, decomposition temperature of uh, classes of clathrate hydrate with similar guests, where the guests have the same uh, general family. And the only thing that changes is one, one location of the guest changes between hydrogen bonding group like oxygen and non-hydrogen bonding group like methylene. And so if we have these different guest species, so for example, we have a propane as compared to dimethyl ether, we see that the structure to propane hydrate at ambient temperature decomposes at 5.7 degrees Celsius. 
whereas dimethyl ether, the structure to hydrate ambient pressure, decomposes at minus 20.7 degrees Celsius. So these, um, these trends can be explained by the hydrogen bond formation of the guest with the cage, which then sort of uh, um, decreases the mechanical stability of the framework and sort of decreases the hydrate um, decomposition temperature at ambient, at ambient pressure. And so this is also another thing that can be explained via the hydrogen bonding. Um, the next discussion is that hydrogen bonding is not necessarily limited to, uh, to structure two clathrate hydrates, but it can also be seen in structure H clathrate hydrates. Um, we've seen that in, uh, uh, we've seen hydrogen bonding in tertiary butyl methyl ether, TBME. Um, so it's been seen there. I'll sort of go, go over this quickly. The interesting thing about TBME uh, for its hydrogen bonds is that the hydrogen bonds are more probable or more stable at low temperature. And the hydrogen bonds between the guest and the host start breaking more frequently at high temperature. So in this case, it could be that the TBME water hydrogen bonds are a little bit more stable than the water water hydrogen bonds. And so as you increase the temperature, they break more frequently. And so, um, and so that's a different trend that we saw with, with, with THF. And in these cases, uh, the hydrogen bond probability um, decreases as a function of temperature and the lifetime of the hydrogen bonds. Also with TBME, you can see is long. So the hydrogen bonds between the cage and the guests are long lived in TBME, whereas they were always short lived in THF. And as the temperature increased, the lifetime of these hydrogen bonds decrease. So the hydrogen bonds are very different depending on what the guest is, what the hydrate is in terms of how they behave. Um, so that's, the, the, that's one aspect. The other aspect which I'll, which I'll go through given that I'm sort of running out of time is the effect of methanol and ammonia as uh, clathrate hydrate inhibitors. We usually recognize these two, these two guests, these two molecules as clathrate hydrate inhibitors. And that's based on um, their thermodynamic effect. So if we add uh, methanol or ammonia to a solution, like to a water solution, what that does is that decreases or makes more negative the chemical potential of the aqueous phase compared to pure water. And so the, um, the right-hand side, so to speak, has a more negative uh, total chemical potential. And so what we see is the phase diagram, of course, shifts to either higher pressures at the same temperature or higher pressures, sorry, higher pressures yes, yeah, so at the same temperature or, higher, or lower temperatures at the same, same pressure. And, that, and that's because of the lowering of the solution chemical potential. But often we sort of also say that the effect of TH of methanol and uh, ammonia is that they also destabilize the hydrate phase. And, and so we say that they, they, these two uh, hydrate inhibitors, thermodynamic hydrate inhibitors have that destabilizing effect. However, the question that, that we sort of raised by some of our work and simulations are, is that true? Do, uh, do these molecules actually indeed destabilize the hydrate phase or not? Um, so this question sort of raised a series of uh, experimental and simulation studies. And uh, the experimental studies showed that indeed methanol and ammonia can be incorporated in hydrate phases. Uh, in, in a, a number of different experimental conditions. So in particular, it's quite easy actually to get uh, methanol and uh, ammonia to form binary hydrates with THF, where they're incorporated into the small cages of the, uh, of the THF molecule. Single crystal X-ray diffraction studies show direct evidence of, of these uh, two molecules in the small cages. And under some conditions, it's also possible even to form methane with methanol or methane with ammonia structure one uh, hydrates. So they can, they can go into the uh, small cages them, themselves. Um, and the simulation shows that the case. So, so the simulations also show that the presence of methanol, for example, which we show here, is not catastrophic to the, uh, to, to the hydrate phase. Yes, as we see here from a methanol extract in a cage extracted from a hydrate simulation, the methanol does fre frequently form hydrogen bonds with the cage waters. Some of them are hydrogen bond donating, some of them are hydrogen bond accepting, but nonetheless, it doesn't necessarily make the, the cage um, collapse. So um, in the presence in this case of a methanol methane structure one hydrate, 
the presence of the methanol doesn't cause the hydrate phase to collapse. And methanol indeed can be stable in this hydrate phase, um, can be characterized by the radial distribution function, which, which I'll uh, pass by right now. Ammonia also does the same thing. Meth ammonia can also be stable in the clathrate hydrate uh, phases. Another interesting behavior though that methanol, that ammonia sort of shows is you can, we started simulations with uh, ammonia in the middle of the, in the center of the hydrate cages. And as we let the simulation progress, we see what methanol, what ammonia also does is ammonia can also kick out some of the waters in the framework. And uh, ammonia is actually quite stable in the water framework itself. And the water that it kicks out can then act as, as a guest in the cages. So this is an interesting behavior that the simulations can show is that ammonia can actually uh, be incorporated in the framework and kick some of the waters out of the framework. So uh, even though it forms str strong hydrogen bonds, there's ways that ammonia can be incorporated in the framework without destabilizing the, um, the, hydrate, the hydrate lattice. Uh, some very interesting behavior that uh, ammonia and methanol show if the in effects that they show on the formation of methane hydrate itself is if we form methane hydrate from powdered ice exposed to high pressures of methane, if there's a little bit of ammonia or um, methanol uh, vapor deposited onto the frozen ice phase and is powdered along with the ice, we can actually see that the rate of methane uptake uh, in the presence of the methanol or ammonia is, is actually enhancing the rate of methane hydrate formation. So here what we see is the rate of, uh, so it's a closed system, the experiment was a closed system under 125 bars of methane gas pressure. And we looked at the rate of, uh, of uh, methane hydrate formation at 253 Kelvin. In the absence of methanol, uh, the, the uh, hydrate, methane hydrate forms slowly. But if we have different percentages of methanol vapor deposited with the ice, we can see that the methane hydrate itself is actually formed quicker. And the same thing happens here with, with ammonia. So under uh, ice conditions, it's actually that low concentrations of methanol and ammonia actually enhance the rate of hydrate formation. So not only are they not hydrate inhibitors, but they also act as hydrate for, formation um, catalyst, we can say in some way, and enhance the rate. So if we're using um, methanol, for example, um, as an inhibitor, we have to be careful that the, um, that the temperature um, of, of the system doesn't uh, go down enough for the ice to, to freeze. If the water freezes, and there's actually low concentrations of, of methanol, for example, it, they actually may act as a uh, hydrate formation enhancer. Now, it's not a catalyst in the sense because some of the methanol is also experimentally determined to be incorporated in the, the hydrate. So it's a, we call it maybe a rate enhancer for methane hydrate. It's not a catalyst because it actually does get incorporated into the hydrate phase. A, a, a mechanism which is tentative because we haven't, uh, uh, we haven't completed this study is that maybe the methanol penetrates through some of the ice phases. And by doing that, it both enhances the diffusion of methane into the ice phase, but also it breaks up some of the, uh, some of the structure of the ice. And so it may uh, facilitate the rearrangement of the ice, uh, of the water molecules in the ice to form clathrate hydrate cages. And that's why um, the rate of methane hydrate formation is enhanced. Um, the last topic, which uh, I'm, I apologize for running over time, is uh, hydrogen bonding guests that are formed in hydrates that, that have water doped with ammonium fluoride. Ammonium fluoride is actually isostructural. Ammonium, solid ammonium fluoride is isostructural with uh, ice, ice, hexagonal ice. So um, the, the, and, and then uh, co experimental colleagues uh, have actually shown that we can dope we can form a water solution with up to 27% ammonium fluoride. And this water solution actually forms clathrate hydrates um, with many hydrate formers, for example, xenon and THF. So you can get a, a structure one xenon hydrate or a structure two THF hydrate, where instead of just water, we have 27% of the water framework is ammonium fluorides. And the interesting thing is that ammonium fluoride doped 
framework was also used to make a pure methanol hydrate. So we can't make a pure methanol hydrate with water, but we can make a pure methanol hydrate uh, if we have water doped with ammonium fluoride. And the reason why we, we think that's the case is we've done simulations here is because the ammonium fluorides are incorporated in the hydrate lattice, they seem to sort of uh, monopolize the hydrogen bondings with the methanol molecule as a guest. And so it seems like the methanol is less disruptive of the hydrogen bonding of the water phase, of the water framework. And so we think it's through this mechanism that the presence of uh, the ammonium fluoride in the water lattice may actually be stabilizing for some very strongly hydrogen bonding guests and so because of that, we can actually get pure methanol um, be, to be incorporated into a hydrate phase. Another interesting effect of, uh, of ammonium uh, fluoride doping is that we can form some hydrate for, uh, hydrates that don't form under normal conditions. And one of those hydrates that doesn't form under normal conditions is a structure to one pentanol hydrate. Uh, one pentanol itself is, is uh, considered to be too big to form structure two hydrate. But if we dope the water phase with ammonium fluoride, we can see that indeed one pentanol does form a structure to, uh, to hydrate. It sort of forms bent configurations, even though it's big to, to decrease its size so it can fit in structure two, but it also sort of uh, engages the ammonium fluoride in the uh, clathrate hydrate phase. And, and so that could sort of uh, also, uh, the, the doping can lead to other hydrogen bonding guests uh, forming hydrates, which we usually wouldn't see. Um, that sort of is the prepared, uh, prepared part of the talk I had. There are some conclusions which I can leave on here um, to read. Um, the, the major conclusions I'd like to say is basically we may, uh, these hydrogen bonding forms a larger repertoire of guests that maybe can, can be considered for, um, for different applications. Um, Maybe and for these guests, of course, the Van der Waals plateau theory would not apply because the hydrogen bonds um, actually make guests from neighboring cages uh, interact. But nonetheless, some of the um, with Monte Carlo simulations and MD simulations, we can sort of get some of the uh, phase information about these hydrates, um, especially then if we incl include the, to the tool of doping of the class rate hydrate with ammonium uh, fluoride, that may also open another set of applications which for regular clathrate hydrates may not be open to us. Um, if you're interested in other details I, uh, about these hydrogen bonding guests, I encourage you to see our recent book or, or refer to some of the um, papers that we had um, before. Uh, once again, I thank you for your attention and thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Labi. Uh, it was very interesting and nice presentation. Uh, so uh, now we open for questions. Our audience can ask through chat or directly ask with your microphone. Uh, firstly, I have a question for you. Uh, do you think the broken broken case with defect can make noticeable change of morphological property like um well it does um sorry if i can change it does it does uh, affect of course the um some of the spectroscopic signatures in the high grade phase but it does decrease the stability and if we're for example looking at gas uh, if we're looking at gas capture so if we're using for example thf and gas capture or, or another large cage gas that forms hydrogen bond on gas capture, it may also affect the gas capture capacity in the small cages. Just like the small cage guests affected the, um, the hydrogen bonding of the large of THF, it could be whether you have THF, for example, as compared with cyclopentane at the same small cage gas pressure methane, that may also, they may also have, of course, different um, uh, methane capturing capabilities as a result of this. So yes, there could be mutual effects in some of those secondary properties in, in addition to the more scientific uh, spectroscopic signatures or, or di uh, dielectric relaxation times or properties like that, that maybe more uh, scientists are interested in. I got the point. Uh, we have raised hand from Dr. Soon. So please ask. Um, <clears throat> Simon, thanks uh, for the nice talk here. It's, uh, 
uh, great. Uh, uh, over the years, you've been uh, doing many of the simulations and uh, I think has added a lot uh, to uh, this interesting uh, guest host interactions. Uh, this latest part that you showed on the ammonia fluoride, uh, I perhaps missed in the literature to publish papers in there or, or didn't pay close attention. Uh, but one interesting thing that uh, you showed, at least from the images, is that the fluoride ion is part of the cage. That, that's correct. If I can share my screen again to show yeah. that picture. Um, okay, let me see. Yes, yeah, so here, for example, we can see that because the, the fluoride uh, and um, ammonium, they're actually isoelectric with water. So they can actually, both of them are incorporated inside the lattice, uh, lattice framework. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and the guests in the case of methanol can both hydrogen bond with the fluoride and it can hydrogen bond with the ammonium. So uh, uh, the, the interesting thing, of course, in X-ray crystallography, you, you don't see the ammonium or the fluoride because they're isoelectronic with the water. And so their diffraction signature is the same. But stoichiometrically, we have 27% in the hydrate, water and 27, uh, and so water and ammonia. So the working assumption is that the ammonium fluoride is incorporated into the lattice. Mm, yeah, uh, uh, th that's quite unusual, right? Uh, from everything else that uh, we know that they are, the fluoride, especially, it would want it to be solvated, uh, right, in, in, in solution, uh, but uh, to be part of the hydrate. Uh, hydrate that's right, and and yeah. Uh, so yeah, with the ammonium fluoride. But it's um, so the, the synthetic um, uh, uh, recipe is basically given in some of these experimental uh, experimental papers. But um, it, so so the crystallography does not show these inside the guest inside the guest cage. So as I said. Uh, in, in some sense, you can say there's no like direct evidence because because they're isoelectronic. We can't see them with the with the crystallography. But as I said, you take that crystal sample and decompose it, you'll see that there's twenty there is twenty seven percent ammonium fluoride in the water solution. So it's I think it's a reasonable assumption that it's in, uh, incorporated into the lattice. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, let, let, let the others uh, ask their question in here. If there's time, I'll ask you some other questions. There are, yeah. there are a couple uh, of questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, I saw. <clears throat> yeah. Please, uh, response to the question from Summer. Okay, um, so first of all, what is the effect of different cations such as Na plus, Ca2 plus, Fe3 on the stability of gas hydrate? Um, yes, yeah, so, so for this question, I guess the, we haven't seen any of the ions incorporated directly inside the cages. So as far as I, I, I'm aware, there's no class rate hydrates with these ions directly as guests. And of course, if you add the salts to the solution phase, they do, do affect the um, stability conditions of clathrate hydrate. So for example, if you're forming methane hydrate from aqueous solution, which would have salts of sodium, calcium, or iron, iron that of course affects the pressure temperature condition um, through, it's a, through their effect on the um, chemical potential of the solution. Um, but I'm not aware that these ions can be incorporated into the clathrate hydrate cages themselves. That would be an interesting simulation to do if we can sort of neutralize, uh, put a, a counter ion somewhere, but uh, I haven't done that, that simulation. So I'm, I hope that answers your question in, in general sense. But in terms of what these ions do in the cage, similar maybe to what the hydrogen bonding guest did in the cage, that would be an interesting, um, uh, interesting point to study. Okay, the next question. Okay, so the next question is regarding, I guess, some details of the simulation procedure is, uh, I have a question for hydrate depressurization. It is hard to use LAMS to control the pressure. Is there some method to make the pressure more stable and more easily to present? So presumably that's for um, in the simulation. Um, 
for these, I guess the best method we use is when you're looking at a hydrate and you really want a better pressure control, um, we just put two reservoirs of gas. Like if we're doing methane hydrate, we put two reservoirs of gas um, around it and uh, simulate, freeze the hydrate phase and allow the gas to uh, reach equilibrium um, before doing our calculation. And through the intermediary of the gas and maybe the barostat, um, we try to stabilize the pressure. Of course, pressure in MD is always uh, one of the uh, quantities which has the highest uncertainty. So um, that's just inherent in the nature of the quantity, but uh, I don't know again if that, hopefully that addressed the question. And it's not only, it's not only LAMS, I guess all, all, uh, all MD software does have this problem. And it's just because of the nature of the, uh, the definition of pressure through the variable expression where it's just a quantity that has large, large uh, uncertainty, unless we have very, very big system or very, very long simulation time. So for small systems that are usually we do simulations on at, at the moment, the, um, the pressure fluctuations are quite large. Yeah, thanks for the kind explanation. And here's another question from- okay, So another question um, from Federico. Professor yeah. Tavares. Okay, that's a, not actually a very good question. Uh, what was the water model used and can the water model change the result observed? And that's, that's a very interesting question. And we've, we've studied that. Um, we know for MD simulations, there's many, many water models. There's, a tip, there's the um, SVCE, which was used in older simulations. There's the TIP4P, TIP4P ICE, TIP4P 2002. And we've seen indeed that um, uh, changing the water model does uh, affect the, uh, the uh, probability of hydrogen bond formation to an extent in the simulations. Um, so that's one, one thing to, to pay attention to. So like, um, and the way we can see how this may correlate to the uh, frequency of hydrogen bonding, for example, the SBCE uh, water model, I think the uh, methane hydrate decomposes in this water model at around 230 Kelvin. So in some sense, the SBC model uh, underestimates the strength of the water-water hydrogen bonds. And so if you're, at, whereas, um, the methane hydrate or uh, or ice even I, sorry it's the uh, it's the melting point of ice that that uh, the SBCE model um, predicts to be around 230 Kelvin. So the SBC model underestimates the strength of water water hydrogen bonds. Even the TIP4P uh, model, which is more accurate, underestimates the uh, temperature of ice melting, and and so it may again underestimate the strength of the water water hydrogen bonds. For our simulations right now, we've sort of uh, 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 landed on using just a TIP4P ICE simulation if we're interested a uh, model, if we're interested in, in hydrogen bonding between water and the guest, because TIP4P ICE is indeed parameterized to give the correct ice um, melting temperature. And so based on that, we assume that it predicts the correct hydrogen bonding strength between the water waters in the ice-like ice lattices, including the clathrate hydrate. And so it would give a more accurate representation. So that is a very good question. And it is something that if someone's doing these simulations, you have to pay attention to the water model because you may overestimate the degree of hydrogen bonding between water and the guests. And of course the water model we get from different sources. So the, the guest potential model we get from different sources, whether that's amber or charm or um, the, uh, the other model, the, the more uh, specialized model for hydrocarbons. So that's a secondary issue, which also perhaps could use more study is the nature of the potential uh, we, we use for the guest in addition to water. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the kind of explanation. Uh, is there anyone who want to ask more? I think uh, we can finish this session in here. Uh, is it okay, Professor Nabi? Yeah, I, I think uh, we, we can conclude in here. Uh, Sam and I have uh, some other things, uh, but I think I will talk with you offline later on. Uh, actually, uh, we have one more question from Frederico. Yeah. Oh, how about polarizable water models? That's again, it's a good question. We uh, we haven't uh, we haven't looked at those yet. 
um, both polarizable models for water and also some of the guests, because um, uh, in, in the case of uh, some of the guest species, uh, polarizability is also important. Um, in addition to hydrogen bonds, for those who are interested, uh, polarizable uh, models for uh, the guests would be important in halogen bonding uh, guests, because for those who are familiar with halogen bonds with, uh, with chlorine or iodine species, polarizable models may be very important in capturing uh, ha halogen bonding. And so that's again, something that we've not explored. What's the effect of the polarizable water model? What's the effect of polarizable guest model, both in the alcohols, amines, and also for these halogen bonding cases. I, I didn't talk about it, but halogen bonding also can raise some interesting questions. So for example, why does bromine form a unique clathrate hydrate structure that no other guest forms? Could it be this specific halogen bonding interaction between bromine and the water and the size that sort of directs bromine hydrate to be a particular structure and, and so on? Or are there some anomalies between maybe chlorine hydrate? So these are all like other interacting guests. So there may be some guest host chemistry in some classes of compounds, which should be should be considered or could be interesting as they may open some potential applications. So thank you. That's also an interesting question, which we should look into, I guess. Okay, thank, thanks for the explanation. Uh, is there anyone uh, who want to ask more? Okay, uh, it, uh, it's time to finish this session. So uh, thank you everyone for attending today and thank you Professor Alabi for the, for the great lecture today. And the fixed next, fixed next webinar is scheduled in May with Dr. Siula. And if something is changed, we'll notice you with email. Uh, that's all, uh, see you all in next webinar. And again, thanks for the great seminar, Professor Alabi. Thank you again for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Look forward to seeing everyone in person at some stage. <laughs> yes, we we did you. All right. Okay, I'll talk to you later, Simon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.